But 2024, 24 Hours of Le Mans, is coming up pretty soon, and I'm kind of amped for it. Because Le Mans is one of my favorite races in the world, really only tied with the Indy 500. And also, the World Endurance Championship this year is incredibly close. If it was not for a late red flag restart, we would have had three different winners in the first three rounds. Porsche, Toyota, and then Ferrari. And we just haven't had that level of competition in decades. I mean, really the last time we had a field of this size with this much competition was the GT1 days of the 1990s. And to celebrate this, I decided to tell my three favorite Le Mans stories based on three different levels of the Le Mans experience. One level of being a team leader, another of being a team, and our topic of today, the level of a single race. And that single race today is one of the most shocking and dramatic of them all, 1995. Often considered one of the most grueling endurance races in the world, the 24 Hours of Le Mans is held every June in France at the Circuit de la Sarthe. Famed for its 3.7 mile long Mulsanne Strait, Group C prototypes in the 1980s could exceed 250 miles an hour. By the time this story takes place, two chicanes were already installed to prevent those speeds from ever being reached again. So let's set the scene as the crowds gathered for the 1995 running. For context, the 1994 event was a strange one, as it saw a mixture of old Group C prototypes, brand new World Sports Car Championship cars, and the newest GC1 class all competing for top honors. And it was won by a Group C Porsche 962 wearing a GT1 trench coat and sunglasses. The FIA wasn't amused by Porsche's loophole and killed off any remnants of Group C, as well as the production car loophole that Porsche exploited. Now, manufacturers actually needed to have a real plan for producing a road-going GT1 car, not just a pinky promise. In theory, we'll hint at that later. But for this year in particular, it was why the 1995 race was almost exclusively mass-production road cars. An incredible 40 out of the 48 entrants were available to buy on showrooms, with just a handful of World Sports Car Championship and LMP2 entrants competing. And it was an incredible field. In the GT2 class, we had Callaway Corvettes, a Honda NSX GT, 911 GT2s, and Marco LM600s all fighting each other. And to show you how seriously teams took this lowest class, look no further than Honda. They brought the NSX GT, not the super rare one of five that would come later. This GT was based off their Phase 1 NSXR GT500 racer that was then shipped over to England for a Le Mans rework. The body was wired, the suspension was rebuilt for the high-speed strain of endurance racing, and the chassis was reinforced with carbon fiber. This was no longer a super GT car, this was an endurance GT car. They also redid the cam profile for the 3-liter V6 VTEC engine, among many other changes, to make 400 horsepower over 100 more than the road car. And then there was GT1. Not only did we have entries from Chevy, Callaway, Dodge, Jaguar, Ferrari, Venturi, and Porsche, but the Japanese arrived in full force. Honda brought an amped up turbocharged NSX GT with 600 horsepower, Toyota brought a modified Super GT Supra Mark IV, and a crazy MR2-ish contraption. And Nissan brought a completely rebuilt Skyline R33 GTR called the GTR LM. No longer was it four-wheel drive, this rear-wheel drive sports car had a curb weight of just 2,500 pounds, a rebuilt wide-body kit designed for cooling, downforce, and stability. It was basically a silhouette car. And to qualify for FIA homologation, Nissan built one road car, showing that the loopholes were still quite a bit loopy. And yet, the crazy Nissan was not the biggest talking point of 1995. That honor might go to McLaren. McLaren's chief technical director, Gordon Murray, managed to convince McLaren CEO Ron Dennis to make the ultimate road car. The three-seater, mid-engine hypercar had a full carbon fiber body and gold foil installation surrounding the engine bay. 
and the F1 needed to have that because of its monstrous 6.1 liter naturally aspirated V12 designed by BMW. Sure, it was based off the M70 V12 from the 750 Li luxury car, but based off is sort of like saying a Hollywood biopic is based off the real thing. Because originally Honda was offered the job, but they couldn't meet Murray's demanding specifications. He asked for a minimum of 530 horsepower, a maximum of 250 kilograms, having block length of 87 millimeters and no forced induction of any kind. BMW did deliver on those promises. It was heavier, but it made 618 horsepower without a turbocharger in sight. The F1 quickly became one of, if not the, greatest road cars ever built. Not only did it have a full stereo and air conditioning unit, and it was really good to drive, helped by that incredibly low curb weight, central seating position, and brilliant engine. It was a classic, immediately, and it looks phenomenal too. It has never aged, and it never will. Oh, and it could do 240.1 miles an hour, making it the fastest production car in the world for 13 years. Each car took over three months to build, and their owners only wanted to do two things, crash and race. McLaren never even thought about racing it. Sure, it seemed like a race car, given everything I just said, but as time went by and the BPR series began in 1994, Murray refused to build a racing car. But that BPR GT series just kept growing in popularity and customers kept prodding. So McLaren relented. It took a lot of racing parts, a new aero kit, and a loss of 30 horsepower to meet regulations, but the F1 GTR was ready to start the 1995 championship. Of course, the one race that mattered wasn't even a part of the BPR series, Le Mans. Now, the McLarens were eligible under the GT1 class since the two series used the same regulation set, and all seven GTRs built up to that point entered the event. And for a highly competitive racing team, they were quite frank about their odds of an outright win. Basically zero, they were hoping for a nice class win to end the road car production in style. And they were right, the pace of the World Sports Car Championship competitors emphasized that. They locked out the top five grid slots, with Welter Racing getting pole position with a 346.0. The McLarens were running 357s and 358s. That's very slow. So beating the prototypes were decidedly out of the question, they were quite literally in a different category. But what's worse for McLaren is that their rivals, running three Ferrari F40s, were in the 55s. So not only were they 13 seconds off the pace of the prototypes, they were two seconds off the pace of their class leaders. Granted, that was still good enough for second place, but that is a very distant second place. And the GT2 field, the Callaway Corvettes, were equally in a class of their own, almost a second faster than the second place Porsche 911 by Turbo. I mean, it was fast enough to mix it up with the lower end GT1 cars. One team was not having that same level of luck. The privateer Honda NSX GT2, driven by future Super GT champion Akita Lita, the father of drifting Kunimitsu Takayashi, and the drift king himself, Kichi Shishiya. They had qualified third in class, but had to start from the pit lane as they fixed a leaking transmission. This immediately put the NSX down to the very back of the grid, and while this was happening, the prototypes buggered off into the distance. Both welter racing cars and both Courage's pulled a four-mile gap on the nearest GC1 car. These prototypes were so fast that the Ferrari 333 SP, which had a bad qualifying session, went from 17th to 4th in just one hour. But then something happened which changed the entire course of the race. It rained, and it didn't stop for 21 hours. This eliminated the horsepower advantage of the prototypes and gave the GT1 cars the edge. Not only did the road-based cars have better traction in the wet conditions, they could carry 20 liters more in their fuel tank. This meant that their lap time delta compared to the WSC cars 
considerably narrowed, and then they could go longer than said prototypes between pit stops. But they still had half a lap to make up, overtake, and then build a large gap in case the rain stopped. And did I mention it was raining when they had to do that? And soon, the leading prototypes began to collapse under the rain clouds. The leading WR cars had windshield wiper problems and a horrific accident that dropped them out of contention and sent one of their drivers to the hospital. Then the fast recovering Ferrari went out with damage on lap 7, and even the 1978 Formula 1 world champion Mario Andretti wasn't immune, spinning his Courage C34 into the barriers, losing 6 laps on the leader, who was remarkably the F1 GTR of Jochen Maas, John Nielsen, and Thomas Bextcher followed by two more McLarens, making it a 1-2-3 by the fifth hour. And they weren't the only ones making progress. Kunimitsu's NSX, having recovered from his pit lane starts, was now recovering again from having to fix an exhaust system. But Lita was showing brilliant pace in the rain, and the father of drifting wasn't bad either, dodging a Ferrari F40 that spun out right in front of them. Pretty soon, those guys were passing the wrecked Porsches littering the track and using the superior fuel economy of their VTEC engine to close the gap to the dominant 1-2-3 of the Callaway Corvettes. Soon, night fell, and so did the rain. It was the most treacherous conditions possible, pouring rain in the middle of the night at 200 miles an hour. But amazingly, the McLarens were still the class of the slippery field holding 1-2-3. But the cracks began to show after leading for almost 9 hours, number 49 McLaren retired with clutch failure, while Derek Bell's car was showing signs of braking issues. JJ Leno didn't seem to have any issues at all in his McLaren. In fact, he was lapping the team's dry lap target times in the wet, pushing the Lanzance Motorsport F1 up to second overall behind the Bell family. Pretty soon, he caught Justin Bell, and after a brief inter-team tussle, Bell spun off on his own, and Lido took the lead. Bell's spin was unfortunate, but no damage was done, and it rejoined in second place. The team was actually concerned about the gearbox. You see, they were pushing these cars very hard to build a gap in case the rain stopped. And that was wearing out the gearbox, causing synchronization issues. Their solution? Buy a bunch of WD-40 and spray an entire can into the gearbox during every pit stop to keep the gear changes as smooth as possible. It may be a bit jank, but it worked, and that meant they could turn their attention to the bigger problem. The Courage that had crashed out of the lead had caught back up to third by morning. Four laps down, sure, but the rain had stopped and there were still several hours to go. Even worse, Andretti was flying. He unlapped himself on the leading number 59 McLaren, and when Derek Bell's car spent five minutes trying to find a gear in the pit lane, the former F1 star took second. There was only an hour left in the race, and McLaren teams were starting to crumble under the pressure of the unleashed prototypes. And they weren't the only ones feeling pressure. The privateer GT2 Honda had used a brilliant economy run to pile on the pressure against the thirsty Callaway V8s. But with both of the other NSXs retired in the GT1 class, victory was anything but certain. It had just about survived the night, losing a headlight to the barriers, but it managed to keep up with the faster number 73 Callaway over the hours of pit stops with bulletproof consistency. And as the morning dawned, both cars were neck and neck on lap 199. The NSX and its drivers never put a foot wrong, and after 10 hours of fighting for the class lead, they managed to pull a two-lap gap with just an hour to go, a lead that they would not relinquish. Honda won the GT2 class, finishing 8th overall in 1995. They even beat the GT1 class Nissan from earlier to earn some national bragging rights. What Honda just did is prove that their little V6 supercar could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best that the world had to offer and win. McLaren was potentially in the same boat, but Courage was closing quickly and Andretti watched from the pits, seemingly about to be the second driver in history to complete the Triple Crown of Motorsports, having already won the Monaco Grand Prix and the Indy 500. The question was, though, 
even at 10 seconds a lap faster, could they make up the distance in just 30 minutes? No. Bob Wallach caught up to within 3 minutes of the number 59 McLaren, but it wasn't enough. J.J. Leto, Yannick Dalmas, and Mansori Kishia won the 1995-24 hours of Le Mans for McLaren on the first attempt. It was the first time a team won on their debut since Ferrari in 1949. They also became the first manufacturer ever to win the F1 World Championship, the Indy 500, and the 24 Hours of Le Mans. McLaren even finished 3rd, 4th, and 5th to wrap up the best debut in the history of the event. It's actually kind of ironic. The handling benchmark when designing the F1 road car was the Honda NSX, and they both won Le Mans in the same year, and neither would win again. Honda tried once more in 1996 before retiring for good, while the F1 would get second overall in 1997 with the GTR long tail. Sure, they got lucky that their debut happened on the wettest race in the history of the event, and they absolutely would not have won without that downpour. But the cars, their drivers, and their teams were good enough and consistent enough to be in a position to capitalize on that opportunity. If any of those elements failed, we would not be talking about the F1 as a racing king. Sure, it won both BPR championships, but the average fan only knows about Le Mans. It's one of only a few events that are bigger than the series it's a part of. So winning that, there's nothing better. And in 1995, nothing was better than the McLaren F1 and the Honda NSX.